My name is Anna Stenstam, and uh, I'm the proud colleague of Tobias Halter, who is today's presenter. Together, we have written an article in Inform magazine, which this webinar will expand upon. Together, we two make up the management team at CR Competence, or CR for short, in Sweden, a Swedish company. And together with our team of uh, scientists, we have worked uh, with contract research for country uh, in different industrial companies for many years. Um, and while we do that, we have used tools of many different kinds. And some that we have found very, very valuable over the years are the focus of today's webinar. And Tobias Halter is our senior expert on these. Tobias Halter got his PhD from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, where he started to work uh, on multi-layer structures using ellipsometry and QCMD. During his postdoc, he continued with these techniques, but began studying systems of relevance for the oral cavity, such as hydroxyapatite, mucin, salivary films, etc. At CR, he has, together with me, worked in more than 140 different projects for approximately 60 companies in 18 different countries. And I'm very happy to have him as my CSO and for us too to have the possibility to present some of our learnings and thoughts about um, surface techniques in this webinar. Before I leave over to Tobias, I want to let you know that you can write questions to, out, to us uh, throughout the whole webinar. You will write them in the question box that you have. We will pause for questions already after an introduction of the techniques and uh, to give you the possibility to ask relevant questions for you at that time point. But we will, of course, also take questions after the webinar. So just keep on writing in the question box and uh, I will try to manage these questions for you and uh, have Tobias answer as well as he can. And with this, I leave over to Tobias Halter for the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Anna. So welcome. Uh, and as Anna said, uh, we are part of a team, a uh, small team. Uh, you can actually see most of us on this picture. Uh, and as Anna said, this uh, webinar is based on the publication from Inform magazine earlier this year in February. And I will go through the basic principles of uh, some surface techniques. And I will say that most of the work I present here is for uh, liquid formulations. And often you measure liquid formulations using scattering techniques, for instance, for, to understand what your formulation look like. But using surface techniques, you can actually measure and try to understand the effect or performance of your formulation, how it acts on the surface. Uh, so, for instance, uh, the deposition of uh, shampoo or hair care products, or even test uh, different ingredients and see how you can change the effect of your formulation. You can also use it to visualize the final end product as a coating versus, or as a surface modification. Um, and I will actually give you some of uh, some different samples of all of these different types of measurements. The presentation will be a bit uh, technique heavy at start, but we will have a lot of examples both from literature and also from projects that we have had with our clients. And some of them are for, for patent applications, other for formulation development or for benchmarking of their products. So uh, there are three different surface techniques covered in the publication and also in this talk. And they are, let's see if I can start the laser pointer here. Also. There. So I'm going to talk about quartz crystal microbalance with dissipation. Uh, ellipsometry, there's actually two different instruments that we have access to at Lund University where we do most of our work, and atomic force microscopy. Now we're going to start with ellipsometry. 
and that's mainly used then for absorption measurements. And ellipsometry is an optical technique. And it's measuring, it's based on measuring the changes in polarization of reflected light as it reflects on a substrate or a surface. And it uses something which is called elliptic light. So that's where the name comes from. And elliptic light is something that you get when you have a phase shift between your electric light wave and your magnetic light wave. And this sort of causes the, the light wave to form, or the vector of the light to form a circle or ellipse. So it sort of rotates as it travels through space, like this picture here, where animation shows you. Uh, the instrument that we use uh, are based on something called nulling ellipsometry, uh, which is based on a principle where you shine elliptically pol polarized light on your substrate, and then the effect of the substrate compensates for, for this uh, phase shift and amplitude changes, so that you get plane polarized light again after reflection. And then by, by analyzing how uh, elliptic your light is before uh, reflecting at the surface and, and sort of the angle of the plane polarized light that you receive afterwards, uh, you can gain information of um, Thin thickness refractive index uh, of a really thin, molecularly thin layer on your surface. And the product of those two can also give you a measurement of the absorbed mass. In this case, it's called a dry mass. So it's the mass of your polymer, surfactant, or protein absorbed to that specific surface. And the surfaces, so substrates used uh, for ellipsometry uh, are usually solid. Uh, so you, you measure at the solid liquid or solid uh, gas interface. Uh, for instance, using uh, silica wafers like this that you cut into smaller pieces. But you can also measure directly on uh, glass surfaces or so plastic surfaces, for instance. And it's even possible to measure at the air-liquid interface uh, and even liquid-liquid interface, but that's way more difficult. So that's the principle behind ellipsometry. If we then turn to QCMD, uh, it's not an optical technique, but it's more of a, uh, it's a microgravimetric technique, mechanical technique, so it's more analog to sound, and sound waves. And the surfaces or substrates you use in this technique are actually the heart of the uh, instrument. And it's based on these small sensors that you can see here on the picture. And they are made by a, a piezoelectric quartz crystal, uh, which are cut in such a way, <clears throat> uh, or I will show you later on, sorry. Uh, so these are the substrate that you use, and that's the heart of the instrument. But, and you have to sort of, uh, you're limited to measure on these type of su uh, substrates, but you can actually modify them, as I will show you in some later samples. So for instance, these are sensors that we have modified by spin coating uh, cooking grease on top of them. And I have some examples for that. And the principle for this instrument is that you have this uh, quartz crystal and it's cut in such a way that if you apply a uh, AT current across the sensor, you will can make it oscillate in shear mode. Uh, so I have a movie here. Okay, I have to turn off the laser pointer. Um, There. So the sensor is res resonating, uh, oscillating as it, at, the, at its resonance frequency. And this frequency is very sensitive to the mass of the crystal. Uh, so as soon as something adsorbs to the crystal, you will detect this as a change in resonance frequency. And adsorption gives a decrease in resonance frequency, as you could see in this movie here. So as soon as these particles and molecules absorb to the surface, the resonance frequency decreased. And it's extremely sensitive. And another thing with this technique is that you also measure the dissipation. And dissipation is a measure of the rigidity or floppiness of your structure. And that's measured by uh, first finding the resonance frequency and then turning off the signal and then measuring how quickly 
this signal decays with time. So that's a measure of how much energy is dissipated from your uh, system to the, the bulk. So using this technique, you measure resonance frequency and dissipation. And these signals will give you information about the mass adsorption, but also about structural changes um, and viscoelastic properties. So if you have a very compact and uh, rigid film or a more fluffy viscous, uh, viscous film absorbed to your surface. And the mass that you measure with uh, QCM is not only the dry mass as for ellipsometry, but it's actually the, the mass of your absorbed layer uh, together with uh, hydration water or other solvent that are trapped inside this layer. So it's more like the total absorbed mass. Okay, so we have looked at ellipsometry and QCM. And sometimes when you combine techniques, you get not just one plus one equals two, but you actually get additional information. So this uh, case we're going to combine an uh, optical technique with a uh, sound or microgravimetric technique. And I have an example here from my uh, postdoc, actually. This might not be related to, to the work that you do normally, but it's a good example explaining what type of information you get from these two techniques and how you can combine it. So I did some work looking at adsorption of mucin which Anna mentioned. And mucin is a glycoprotein. Uh, so it's actually a very long extended uh, protein and it has hydrophilic negatively charged patches, glucosylated patches. Then it also has some hydrophobic patches, sort of naked patches, and some thiol end groups. And then I also had uh, lactoperoxidase, which is in a way it's opposite to mucin. This is more of a globular protein or actually an enzyme and it carries a high positive charge. So using ellipsometry, if we uh, and this is on a hydrophilic silicon, uh, sorry, silica substrate, uh, when adding mucin to this uh, system, it absorbs. So here we can see the absorbed amounts. Uh, as it absorbs to the surface, it goes up to about one milligram per square meter, so that's not very much, but still. Uh, the arrow here points to uh, rinsing, so after absorption for a while, I start to rinse. This is after an hour of absorption. And you can see that most of the uh, mucin stays attached, nothing much happens. You also see some uh, thickness information here, so that the layer is about 150 angstroms thick, so that's 15 nanometers, and this is the refractive index of that salt layer. And the thick layer, sort of low mass, thick layer, and relatively low refractive index indicates that this is a layer, uh, so it's not that much adsorbed, but it's very swollen and hydrated. So you get a thick film with a low refractive index, and the refractive index can be seen as uh, the density optical density of the film. So if we then add lactoperoxidase afterwards, we get a huge increase in, in absorption here. So more mass is added, nothing much happens when we rinse, but we can also see that the thickness actually collapses. So this means that the, the very swollen hydrated mucin and negatively charged uh, is sort of compacted when you add this uh, small globular high positive charge protein. So the thickness collapses and the refractive index increases. So this tells us that we get a more dense uh, film, lower thickness and higher refractive index. The same measurement then using QCMD, we see a change in uh, resonance frequency when we add the mucin, quite a high response because this is a thick uh, floppy layer. So this is the total mass then for actually refractive, uh, sorry, resonance frequency, but it's related to the mass of the uh, adsorption and not only mucin in this case, but uh, the total mass. So also including hydration water. We can see a, a larger change here when we rinse, and this is because uh, QCM is much more sensitive to 
small changes in the bulk uh, viscosity. So uh, when we measure here, we have lots of mucin molecules uh, floating around uh, in close proximity to the surface, and that sort of gives a larger response than only the uh, absorption. But this uh, is removed then when we rinse. And then when adding um, lactoperoxidase, we have another decrease in resonance frequency. So that's again uptake of mass because we have further absorption of the other protein. And if we look at the dissipation in this other graph here, we can see that uh, uh, mucin gives really high uh, dissipation corresponding to a thick, floppy, swollen layer, highly hydrated layer. And when we add lactoperoxidase, it sort of compacts to more rigid layers. So very, sort of the same information as we can see using ellipsometry, but in a different way. Using QCM data, the raw data, you can also plot it, the dissipation against the frequency, as in this graph down here. So it, in that way, you actually remove the time factor and instead you can see different uh, viscoelastic regimes in your absorption process. So for the first layer here, the mucin absorption, we have a high slope indicating that we have a floppy swollen layer and then adding lactoperoxidase, we sort of go down to more rigid uh, elastic layer. Uh, using QCMB, we can also, or using some modeling that are included in the, the software for the program, you can uh, calculate the void mass, so that's sort of the total mass absorbed uh, in your film. And um, if you then compare the mass obtained from uh, QCM with the one obtained from ellipsometry, you can actually sort of calculate the, the water content uh, in your layer. And here is, so it's approximately 90% water in this first um, regime here, but that's in parenthesis because remember that I told you that this is also affected by um, slightly higher viscosity when having mucin present in, in the bulk. But after rinsing, we have about 85% water in our layer. So that corresponds pretty well with a highly hydrated uh, thick layer. And then adding lactoperoxidase, we get this more compact layer, so that it throws out water and we go down to 40% water content instead. Using this software, you can also calculate the viscoelastic properties such as viscosity and shear modulus. So by using both of these techniques, you can get not only the dry mass, but also the total mass and the water content you get thickness, refractive index, viscosity, and shear modulus. So a lot of information just by doing uh, two measurements in two different uh, instruments. And this was all done at, uh, on um, silica, so hydrophilic silica surfaces. Now we'll, I will give you an example where this first part, the mucin absorption, is done on uh, different substrates instead. So here we have the uh, ellipsometry data for um, using adsorbed to silica, so this is the same as before, and also the blue line here for QCMP. Um, this is actually the, the inverse uh, frequency change, so it's positive instead of negative here. Uh, and then we can compare that with uh, two other substrates. So the green line in both graphs are a hydrophobic surface, so that's a hydrophobically modified silica surface where we have a C8 uh, carbon chain on our surface. And then we can see in both uh, ellipsometry and QCMD that we get a higher absorption of mucin. And the red line is gold, which gives you even higher absorbed amounts in both uh, instruments. And then looking also at the thickness and refractive index from ellipsometry, we can see that, okay, the, this uh, hydrophobic layer it gives a higher mass, but it gives a lower thickness and a higher refractive index. So that tells us that more is absorbed, but it's also more compact. Thinner layer with higher refractive index. So uh, that would tell us that we have a situation more like this, where the mucin layers are lying more flat on the surface, probably absorbing with the hydrophobic patches in close proximity to the surface. And then for uh, the gold surface, 
we have sort of more or less the same thickness as for the silica, but also more dense layer, as we can see by a higher refractive index, indicating that we have sort of a, uh, well, more absorbed mass compared to silica, but also more dense. And this could be that uh, the thiol N groups anchor to the gold because uh, thiol can give a covalent bond uh, to gold surfaces. So you can actually also see uh, very well differences comparing the, the substrate, how different molecules absorb, and especially if you have some information of the molecules that you are investigating, like the dimension of it or the nature. Um, like uh, charge and uh, if it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic. Okay, so that's the principles for both ellipsometry and QCM. So this is where we have some time for initial questions for you before I go into more examples with these two techniques. Yes, thank you, Tobias. And uh, we do have a lot of questions. Um, I will have to manage this really quickly. But first, a very, uh, very um, short question. Um, just, just to clarify, because you talked about different surfaces for the QCM. Uh, what, um, how, how limited are, um, are you when it comes to these surfaces? Gold, uh, silica. Um, modified in what way or what are your limitations there to be us okay yeah so i mean the the, the sensor is made of uh, quartz uh you select it quartz but then you, it's always uh, you always have a gold layer coated on top uh, as the electrode but that surface can in turn then be uh, coated with other uh, materials such as uh, silica for instance uh, different metals i've used uh, titanium stainless steel, uh, carbon steel. Um, you can also coat it with uh, hydroxyapatite, for instance, for, for uh, oral applications, uh, sort of simulating the, the animal of your teeth. Uh, you can spin coat it with uh, different plastic materials, polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, teflon, mm. uh, or create okay. more biologically like uh, substrates, like um, uh, bilayers to, to sort of simulate uh, cell membranes. Okay, because we got one question that related more to the industrial coating applications, print and packaging, fiber coatings, metals, and there you already mentioned polyethylene, aluminum, so um, I guess the answer to, to that question is yes, there are many possibilities, stainless steel, you've mentioned so that could be one then we also got from a completely different um area i think a question on if this could be used to study um uh for example a biopolymer associating to an oil droplet and then my question is would you then sort of try to modify the surface to be as the oil droplet and having a biopolymer or the other way around or would you not use these techniques at all? Uh, the question is really, can the ellipsometry technique be used for emulsion stability and interfacial layer studies of biopolymers at oil droplet surfaces? So. Yeah, okay. So you cannot do it to droplet surfaces uh, in any other techniques. Uh, for ellipsometry, you can do measure absorption to a liquid-liquid interface. So that's, you can actually measure absorption to to oil surface um, floating on top of a water uh, face, but it will be a flat surface. You need a flat surface to get reflection, so it cannot be a droplet. So that, that's a possibility uh, for sure. It will be difficult as soon as you start to add uh, uh, a uh, emulsifying surfactant, because then it's very difficult to, to keep a flat, nice interface. Uh, what I would do is probably to look at it more fundamental so, I mean, an oil droplet is very hydrophobic. So, I would first go for a hydrophobically modified solid surface. And that could be used both for QCM and ellipsometry to sort of model an oil surface by using long uh, carbohydrate chains instead. Okay. Um... We have uh, one quick question also, uh, what the detection limit is of uh, the methods? What would you say there? 
they are both extremely uh, surface sensitive. So ellipsometry, you can measure a few angstroms of adsorption, so it's um, less than monolayer. It is limited by the optical contrast. So if you have a very diffuse layer on your surface, which doesn't really give a, a contrast towards water, you will not really see uh, that absorption. You will not get uh, thickness and refractive index data for sure. You might get some uh, absor absorption data, absorb mass. But yeah. as soon as you get sort of a contrast, you have enough of molecules there, uh, you will get a nice signal. And that's, yeah below a, a monolayer of surfactants or polymers. So it's really sensitive. And when it comes to uh, QCMD, I think that's actually even more sensitive because even if you have a very diffuse layer, that diffuse layer might be very swollen. Uh, so sort of elongated uh, polymers, for instance, uh, penetrating far out in the bulk. And that will actually affect the resonance frequency quite a lot, even though there's only a few molecules absorbed. So definitely below uh, monolayer uh, for that technique as well. Okay, I will need to let you continue. But for all of you who are writing questions, um, some of them we will absolutely uh, cover in the spe speak, because I know that, for example, we will talk about surfactant and uh, polymer deposition. Uh, so that will come up. And uh, otherwise, um, some of the questions will be um, brought up in later in the, in the after the final presentation, or we will have to continue with you uh, afterwards because some of them, I think, Tobias will be really interested in uh, talking more science than techniques, maybe. So um, with that, Tobias, you can continue with your examples. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, so. Sorry. Uh, the first example then is actually from a pharmaceutical formulation. This is a project, actually the first one I, I did uh, 10 years ago when I started at CR. So it's for a client in pharma. They have this really potent and expensive protein. Uh, it's so potent that you have to use it at really low dosages, but it's also uh, adsorbed to all surfaces. Uh, so that's a problem because then, of course, you, you make it in uh, liquid formulations at low concentration and you have all this uh, uh, batch uh, mixing and stuff and also pipes in the process where the uh, protein can absorb, as well as uh, also the, the glass vials and the syringe and the needle when you administer it. So all these surfaces will actually be available for the protein to absorb, and thus you have less and less uh, of your expensive protein in the formulation uh, to, to get the, the final effect for the patient. So here's the ellipsometry data for absorption of this protein uh, on a hydrophilic uh, silica surface. So this is sort of mimicking a uh, glass bio. And you can see that there's a really high absorbed amount this is a protein that it sticks to almost everything. We have five milligrams per square meter absorbed uh, at actually a really low dosage. And uh, nothing much really comes off when you rinse with a pure uh, buffer in this case. So it, it absorbs and it sticks to the surfaces and it stays there. And that's of course what they want to avoid. And they had the, this idea that maybe you could block absorption using a surfactant. So this is the adsorption of that specific surfactant that they wanted to check. It has a much lower adsorption, uh, but it also adsorbs to surfaces. The surfactants adsorb really nicely to surfaces, and uh, usually it's uh, more or less um, reversible, especially on hydrophilic surfaces. So the rinsing cycle is actually not here, but most of it would come off uh, when rinsing. So you can see that there's a distinct difference in absorbed amount comparing the surfactant and the protein. And if you first absorb the protein, uh, sort of add that to your liquid cuvette and let it absorb and measure in C2, and then add your surfactant afterwards, you can see that some of the, uh, some of the protein is actually uh, removed from the surface. So some of it is, is removed and goes back into the bulk. So that's a good thing, of course, but it's still not good enough. 
but if you mix the protein and surfactant in the formulation and then add them together you get this adsorption instead so and that's more or less spot on the same uh, adsorption as for the pure surfactant which tells us that uh, in this case actually the surfactant only adsorbs to the surface leaving the protein in the bulk uh, free to to uh, or to remain in the bulk and, and be used by the patients. And the reason why uh, the surfactant adsorbs it um, only, sort of, and not, well, we cannot really see uh, much of the protein adsorbing is probably because the concentration of the surfactant is way higher and it's also a smaller molecule. So it will diffuse much quicker to the substrate and, and uh, uh, effectively adsorb to the surface and then also block. Uh, the surface from adsorption of the protein. So the client was of course really happy with this and this led to a uh, patent application where they used this data uh, for their claims to prove that this surfactant gave a blocking effect. So that was the first example and uh, now we will go into something completely different, namely uh, shampoo, so personal care and coethivate deposition. So, uh, maybe some of you already know, but for those who don't, uh, most shampoos, or at least the shampoos that are made to, to deposit on your hair, like care shampoos, uh, consists of um, negatively charged surfactants and positively charged polymers. And they are mixed in your shampoo uh, to actually give a deposition at specific conditions. And that will give you a, a conditioning effect where your hair is uh, sort of turning more hydrophobic, uh, so it's easily to comb and uh, yeah, less frizzy. Uh, and your shampoo uh, has a high surplus of uh, surfactants, so then you're in this situation, this cartoon is not really correct, but you're at a situation where you have lots of uh, free micelles, but also complexes with where these negatively charged micelles make uh, complexes with the positively charged polymers, but these complexes are still soluble because they are hi highly overcharged by the large amount of or surplus of negatively charged surfactants. And then using ellipsometry, you can start on this end here where you have only the, the positively charged polymer, and then uh, stepwise add, titrate in more and more of your negatively charged uh, surfactant while measuring uh, the absorbed amount. And that's what we see in the graph here, and it's tested for, for different uh, polymers. So UCARE and Enhance are sort of benchmark polymers used a lot in uh, uh, for shampoos. And then the client had three different types of their polymer that they wanted to test against these benchmarks. And then you can see that at a specific concentration or ratio between uh, surfactant and polymer, you start to get uh, deposition. So this is when you have a balance where you form uh, these coesivates that are less soluble and they actually start to deposit and go to your surface. Uh, and then you have this uh, concentration area here where you can see that you get deposition on the surface. And that of course it is different for the different polymers and the nature of the polymers. So the information that we can gain from this is the optimal concentration range for your formulation. So sort of, you want to be close to the deposition limit on this side here with your, with your shampoo formulation so that when you start to dilute uh, in the shower, when you rinse, you want to go quickly into this uh, deposition range here. You can also see the effect of the charge density of your polymers. So they had different charge densities for, for these three, and that will sort of determine a bit where this window uh, will be found. And also some information about the hydrophobicity of your uh, polymer. Uh, for instance, the, the enhanced here is uh, more hydrophobic than the other uh, polymers, and that will also shift this window where uh, the position happens. And the client then used this data for, for benchmarking, comparing with uh, competitors on the market, so like a marketing material, but also to sort of tell the clients um, at least uh, 
sort of whereabouts uh, in this mixing ratio they should try to make their formulations. Then I have an example from the literature, and that's actually then uh, the more true way of doing how it works with the shampoo. So then we start with a shampoo formulation with a high surfactant uh, to polymer ratio, and then we add that to the cuvette in the ellipsometer. And as I said, at this um, mixing ratio, uh, the complexes are soluble, so nothing really absorbs to the surface. So that's why you only see sort of a baseline here at first. And then at time zero, you start the rinsing in the cuvette, and then you continuously dilute uh, the liquid or the formulation, shampoo formulation in the cuvette. And then you can see that you, after a specific time point, you start to get the position on your surface. And in this case, it was done with uh, uh, cationically uh, modified hydroxyethylene uh, uh, cellulose and the SDS mixture, and also with and without the addition of uh, silicon oil. And you can see at some specific starting mixtures, so if you start with really high SDS concentration here, you don't really get much deposition because then you're too far away from the uh, deposition window. Uh, but if you then have a lower surfactant to polymer ratio, you get the position when you start to rinse. And in this case, there was not much difference comparing with and without uh, the um, silicon oil. But then at the lowest uh, surfactant to uh, polymer ratio, there's actually a, quite a dramatic effect here, telling you that you get cold deposition. So it's not just the coercivates that uh, deposit but they are actually also hydrophobic enough to sort of entrap and bring down the silicon oil droplets in this case to attach to the surface. So the deposition and co-deposition depends very much on your starting formulation for shampoos, the ratio between the polymer and surfactant, and of course the nature of both as well. And here is a similar example then uh, that we made for a client. Uh, they wanted to test uh, different uh, ingredients and different relations or ratios uh, uh, using different ingredients in their shampoos. So here they are just named shampoo one, two, and three because we cannot disclose the compositions. And this is the, the position to a hydrophilic surface. And again, we start with a sort of a pure, uh, well, it's not a full shampoo formulation, but it's uh, slightly um, diluted already here, but it's before it starts to deposit. And then at time zero, we start to rinse. So diluting uh, the formulation in the cuvette. And then we can see that they, these three uh, shampoo formulations behave very differently. So we have the highest residual deposition with shampoo one. So residual deposition is how much really stays attached to the surface after you have rinsed it thoroughly. So this is sort of after Leaving the shower, you want to have something staying attached and deposit, uh, deposited to your hair. Uh, shampoo 2 here has some medium um, residual deposition. And shampoo, uh, sorry, shampoo 3, that was, it's wrong in the text. Whereas the red one here has a really high transient uh, deposition. So it starts really nice, a lot of uh, mass deposition. It really does not want to be in, uh, in bulk. So it really deposits on the surface, but when you continue to rinse, it actually detaches again. Uh, so what looked good at first is not really the, the best for the end game for this formulation. And uh, these measurements were done in sort of medium high hard water uh, conditions. And if you do the same measurements in soft water, so without the presence of calcium or other divalent ions, you still see this high transient effect for, for that shampoo, but all of them sort of end up uh, in the same range uh, with really low uh, residual depositions. So this is uh, ongoing work and formulation development where we help the client to really evaluate different compositions and different materials. And that was it for shampoo and coercivates. 
So now I have a few examples for hard surface cleaning and using uh, uh, surfactants. And uh, cleaning with surfactants uh, takes place mainly through three different mechanisms. Uh, you can either have the roll-up mechanism where the surfactant sort of lift, lifts up the uh, oil, in this case, a hydrophobic uh, stain from your surface, uh, creating a uh, emulsion uh, in your bulk. Uh, or you can have uh, like a budding effect uh, where it's sort of very similar to roll-up, but it, you, you have roll-up sort of removes it completely like droplets from, from the substrate. That can actually mainly happen on hydrophilic surfaces um, where you get this one, whereas budding you sort of take drop by drop uh, and uh, sort of removing more and more of this uh, oil film on your surface. Or you can have solubilization, where you actually solubilize uh, the hydrophilic, uh, sorry, hydrophobic oil inside your micelles and get slightly swollen micelle structures. And here I just want to emphasize that this is really a, still a one-phase um, system, uh, isotropic system, whereas in this case you create a uh, emulsion, which is not hydro. Um, thermodynamically stable. So uh, using lipsometry you can study this and then you have to have a, a substrate, a model substrate. And this is from a publication. Uh, it's from Lund University. Oh, uh, sorry, this is actually from uh, Linköping where they used uh, PVC, so plastic surface. And you, then you first characterize the clean hydrophobic substrate uh, with a lipsometer to, to understand uh, what that looks like. And then you can spin coat uh, your surface with a hydrophobic uh, model soil. In this case, they used uh, three palmitine. And then you can add your detergent while measuring this uh, surface. And then you will also measure in situ uh, the removal uh, of that soil. Uh, as you get this detergent effect happening. And here are some data. So they started with the absorbed amount of the, the tree palmitine of um, five uh, micrograms per square centimeter. So it's a thick um, model grease or soil um, on this plastic surface. And when they add the surfactant, you can see that the absorbed amount decreases with time here. So part of it is reinstalled, and this was using a uh, non-ionic etoxylated surfactant. Uh, and they did this for, for many different uh, surfactants and different concentrations. And you can see that at low concentrations, the, the detergent detergency effect is very minimal. But uh, once you pass the CMC, you sort of get a higher detergent effect. And it's more or less the same as long as you stay above the CMC. Uh, and they tested different combinations also, and uh, the, the effect of the critical packing parameter uh, of the surfactants and the overall system uh, for this detergent effect. So, for instance, they had this um, uh, non-ionic etoxylated surfactant, which is uh, sensitive to temperature. So, uh, this here indicates the cloud point. So, as many of you probably know, when you increase the temperature for etoxylated non-ionic surfactants, uh, they get more and more hydrophobic or less less uh, hydrophilic that, that group, and that will effectively affect the uh, critical packing parameter or the sort of uh, theoretical theoretical shape of the surfactant. So it will turn from a, a sort of a cone shape type of surfactant that easily forms micelles into a more uh, cylindrical shape where the head group and the tail is sort of uh, in balanced more in, in same size. Uh, so these will not be good at forming micelles, but this shows you that the, the optimal cleaning effect uh, you actually achieve when you're close to a quick um, critical packing parameter of one. This is where you have a minimal um, interfacial ten tension between water and uh, the oil that you're removing. They also tested uh, the addition of uh, 
uh, a long chain alcohol. So this is measurements with SDS and then adding more and more decanol. And that's sort of the same effect. You have SDS, which is uh, has this conical shape and then decanol, which is sort of inverse. So they, it's a really crappy surfactant, but it can be seen as a surfactant with a tiny head group. And when they are combined, they sort of together give you this uh, critical packing parameter close to one, and that's also where you get the optimal cleaning effect. And here's an example where they mixed two different surfactants, so uh, linear alkene benzene uh, sulfate, very commonly used in laundry applications, and they then mixed in a uh, non-ionic etoxylated surfactant, this time with a really small head group, meaning that this one effectively has a small head group, whereas the loss has a large one. And then again, you can see that at ratios where you sort of form more of a critical uh, packing parameter close to one, you have the optimal cleaning. Uh, this have also been done with the uh, QCM. Uh, we have done it for some clients, but we cannot share that data. Uh, but it's also been done actually by um, Violin, uh, the company manufacturing the, the instruments. And I think actually some of them are listening today. So they have used uh, QCMD sensors, I think it was silica sensors, and uh, coated it with uh, cooking grease, which is more harsh than the uh, cheap hamletine used in the publications. Uh, so this is sort of to simulate um, what gets burned in your or your frying pan or this really sticky grease that you can have on your uh, bench top maybe. And they tested a lot of different uh, surfactants uh, and saw that in all cases you had very similar effects uh, using uh, QCMD. So you have sort of different regimes. So there's a pre-rinsing step. This is the baseline here sort of before adding the detergents. And then when you add the detergents, you first have absorption. So this is where it starts to add mass, and that is seen as a negative response in the refractive, uh, sorry, the resonance frequency. And simultaneously, uh, as uh, absorption, you also get swelling. So uh, surfactants go to the surface, absorb, but they also sort of start to swell uh, the grease on the surface, and that is seen both as a mass uptake, so that it continues to decrease the resonance frequency, but also as a huge response with increased um, dissipation, which tells us that the thickness really swells and you get a hydrated layer. Uh, and they've also provided this uh, sort of um, blow up of this part here where you can see First, the adsorption and swelling, so a decrease in uh, resonance frequency, and also this increase in dissipation from the swelling. Uh, from this, they could read out some different data values. So for instance, the time to maximum swelling here, the apparent removal rate, which is here when the, the uh, surfactants actually start to lift off and remove the grease. So that's the slope of this. Uh, removal part here, and also the total deposit removal, which is sort of where you end up at the end of your rinsing cycle. And they also have a final rinsing step here where they rinse with pure uh, water afterwards. Uh, so you actually see even more uh, mechanical properties using QCMD for this uh, detergency effect. And they tested this for, for different uh, formulations, different cleaners, hard surface cleaners, and could see that these values then differed uh, a lot. So some of them were really quick response. Uh, so you have absorption and swelling happening really fast, and then you sort of remove everything, whereas others took much longer time um, for swelling and sort of penetrating into the film. And you can see these different regimes uh, where you sort of have the initial part and then sort of swelling where you start to see this roll up or budding uh, happening, uh, sort of the swelling of your layer. And finally, uh, the removal where it starts to really detach from the surface. 
and then scoring these different sort of time to maximum swelling, the apparent removal rate and the final total removed value, they could score these different detergents and, and sort of compare them uh, together like this. Uh, so that's very useful for, for testing uh, your detergents and, and sort of testing different surfactants or mixtures of surfactants to see where you have your optimal uh, effect and sort of the mechanics for how it actually operates and works at the surface. Okay, then we will also talk uh, briefly about AFM, so atomic force microscopy. And this is also more of a mechanical instrument <clears throat> where you have a scanning probe a cantilever that is in contact with your sample. And then you shine a laser on this cantilever, which is reflected to a detector. And then if the, <clears throat> if the tip here changes, um, well, if the bend of the tip changes, that would be registered as a change in this detector here. I will show you some more information about that later on. Um, but using this, you can then um, get the surface topography and structure of um, surface or film on your surface. But you can also use it to measure uh, normal forces versus distance to take uh, uh, surface force curves. And actually also for friction forces or torsional uh, forces. But in this presentation, we will focus on the topography and structure part. So this is just animation to show you a bit more how it works. So you have the substrate here, and the laser reflected on the cantilever hitting the detector. And this is your tip then, which is in, in this case in contact with the substrate. So what you do is that you start to scan, move the substrate. And if you then hit an obstacle or a change in the structure on the surface, this will cause the cantilever to bend. And actually, then the reflection will move off center from the detector, uh, which will give you a response in the deflection or error um, sort of front center value. And there's a feedback loop constantly checking the deflection in this instrument. And as soon as you get this error or deflection detected, the instrument will respond by uh, compensating the height uh, of the cantilever. And this will then give you the topography signal, so how it will sort of have to adjust for the obstacles on the surface. And the same thing will then, of course, happen on the other side here, where it goes down. You get the deflection the other way instead, and uh, the that level will be compensated. And here's an example of aluminum foil, which has been then uh, measured using this technique in contact mode. And that's when you're in contact, constantly scanning across your surface. This is on the shiny side of aluminum foil, so you can actually see the grooves here. It's from the making of the foil um, from uh, the rollers. And you can get this uh, 3D structure where you sort of blow up the said uh, part of it to, to see uh, a bit more details. But you can also have a 2D topography map. And the error or deflection signal can also be used because here you instead see um, structures as uh, shadows or, or more light parts. You can also use it in um, tapping mode, which is more common actually. So instead of uh, sliding your probe across the surface, it's actually oscillating, sort of uh, bouncing on your surface or bouncing just slightly above the surface, bouncing on repulsive forces instead. And instead of um, arrow signal, you, you get uh, a change in the amplitude when uh, it hits an obstacle like this. And this is an example for a lipid bilayer film. Uh, on a silica substrate. This was a client that wanted to prove that their formulation actually formed bilayers on hydrophilic substrates. And if you make a cross section here across, uh, you can even measure the step height. So this red one here shows a step height of close to four nanometers, which is approximately the, the height that you expect to get from a bilayer. 
and then you can see the white parts here that's where you actually have uh, two bilayers on top of each other and then you get closer to eight and nine eight or nine uh, nanometers instead so it really showed you uh, them that they they had these uh, bilayers forming on the surface and when using tapping mode you also get uh, the phase response so that's uh, how the phase of the oscillation is changed depending on the material that the cantilever is bouncing on or the tip is bouncing on. So this will give you information about um, uh, elasticity or sort of the hardness of your substrate. And here you can also see a clear contrast between the really hard silicon substrate and the softer uh, lipid bilayer. Okay, and then we will have some examples from laundry projects and in this case the client wanted to have a model substrate so they, they own their own QCMD instrument and they wanted to be able to measure the effect of different surfactants uh, on cotton uh, and uh, to do that you, you can make a model surface of uh, cellulose because cotton consists mainly of cellulose so we spin coated uh, cellulose nanofibers onto the surface and in this case it's we started with a gold substrate and this is actually a combination of AFM images and uh, XC to QCMD. So normally you use both ellipsometry and QCMD in situ so you measure during your adsorption but you can also use both techniques ex situ to measure your substrate before and after a certain adsorption or process. So this is measurements in uh, water of the pure uh, gold substrate. We then spin coated a, a cationic modified um, cellulose nanofiber. And then we could see that we got some adsorption. And then after that, we added the um, sort of non-ionic um, cellulose fibers with a much higher um, mass. So we got a huge build up uh, of a really nice uh, thick uh, coating of cellulose fibers that we can see in the AFM pictures here. And this QCM data is then from uh, liquid. And we could also see that we had a really stable baseline with this uh, model surface in liquid in water uh, so that you can then in the next step add uh, surfactant or some other things to, to sort of see how this uh, absorbs or modifies the cellulose on the surface. Uh, we did the same measurements also in air. So this is QCM data for gold and then modified with the cellulose, uh, but measured it in, in air instead. And then you actually can get the, the dry mass of the absorbed uh, cellulose to the surface. And they also wanted to be able to reuse these uh, substrates because the sensors, QCMD sensors, are quite expensive. So it's uh, really good if you can actually use them several times. And we could show that just by using the ordinary cleaning protocol for the gold coated uh, sensors. So after you have done your measurements you, or you first coat them with the cellulose, you do your measurements and then you can clean them as you normally do with the gold sensors and then we could we could uh, measure that we removed all of the cellulose from the surface which you can also see here by the afm image so this is the, the pure uh, clean gold substrate that we see again and we actually go back to even a bit <clears throat> above the first baseline so either the the uh, ex situ measurements are not perfectly accurate, which is often the case when you have to take your substrate in and out from the chamber, but it could also be actually that we have stripped off some of the gold, but it's still there and can be reused. And this is then the same, <clears throat> but also in air, where we also see that we go back to even above the baseline. So this was also made then for their internal formulation development to test their formulations. And we have also used it internally for a completely different project where they wanted to check the effect of uh, bleach and how that sort of affects uh, cotton. So that was actually the last example. So with all these examples, I 
hope that, that you get a better understanding for the techniques, uh, the principles, how they work, and also that they are actually really useful and vital for product development, uh, both for processes, but also to optimize your formulations, even for packaging, like uh, for the pharma case, and also for performance to understand how they actually interact and act at the intended substrate. So with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, hand over to Anna for questions. Yes, Tobias, um, we have several questions here. Um, first of all, uh, a, a shorter one, uh, for the hair care type of uh, projects, do you have any uh, suggestion on what type of model surfaces that you would use in that situation to look at hair care products? Yes, so once again, both ellipsometry and QCMD are limited to model surfaces uh, and they are sort of macroscopic surfaces, so you cannot use actual hair in your uh, instruments. Uh, so then you sort of have to be a bit more fundamental and understand the, the type of uh, the nature of the substrate that you want to, to uh, understand. So for instance, hair uh, is hydrophobic. Uh, virgin hair, when it sort of grows uh, on your scalp, is hydrophobic. It has a fatty layer. So to mimic that, uh, you normally use a hydrophobic substrate, like a hydrophobized silica substrate or a plastic surface even. Uh, whereas, um, I mean, most shampoo and conditioners are more aimed towards uh, damaged hair, hair that has been uh, treated or uh, maybe bleached, bleached or colored. And then you remove this hydrophobic part and get a more hydrophilic surface, actually negatively charged surface. And therefore, you usually use uh, hydrophilic surfaces like silica instead. Mm. It's hydrophilic and negatively charged. And then I have another question, and that's uh, related to uh, fouling on, uh, for example, stainless steel. So let's say you want to study the fouling from dairy products on uh, stainless, stainless steel. Um, anything that you've seen or could recommend regarding that? Uh, yes, we, we actually had a project about uh, that even checking uh, fouling at different temperatures uh, using QCMD. Uh, so, short, I mean, you can use a, a, a stainless steel surface even, both for ellipsometry and QCM. Uh, and uh, yeah, just adding your diary, uh, dairy, uh, you probably need to use uh, diluted systems uh, for uh, specifically for ellipsometry because then it needs to be uh, very low turbidity because you have a light beam going through your uh, liquid phase. Uh, QCMD is less sensitive for turbidity, so you can actually have measure on turbid systems. Uh, but you also have this bulk viscosity effect, so it's easier to get a better understanding if you have at least slightly diluted systems. But you can easily, easily uh, measure the adsorption of um, casein micelles, for instance, or, or even uh, denatured um, proteins and uh, aggregates. Mm -hmm. Layer. Then I have another question, and that's related to multiple layers. So if you have something where you want, let's say you have this cellulose uh, type of the surfaces that you showed both AFM and uh, I know that you've run QCM with it. You have cellulose fibers that you stain with lipids, so they're hydrophobic. I mean, they're dirty fibers, uh, really. Can you use that? Can you have control of that type of model surface? So, so the cellulose is uh, stained or sort of uh, b before yeah. absorbing to the surface. Yeah, I don't know how to make them, but I mean, like you, you have oil on the stainless steel example. Could you have oil on the fibrous example? Uh, yes, um, sure. Um, I guess so. I mean, it will be more complex. You, you have to measure each step, so you, you sort of first make your pure model, uh, sort of pure cellulose system and, and uh, characterize that so that you know what you have. And then you can probably spin coat uh, your soil sort of on top of that and, and characterize again to see what you have. 
but then of course it will be sort of a layered structure um, but I guess that would sort of simulate um, staining on the fabric at least mm. if you make it thin enough mm. but it would and be more really difficult to understand exactly what, ha what happens I think Yes, because then we have the interpretation that you haven't really mentioned so much. But of course, these data that you've presented, I know from listening to you many times that interpreting this data is um, much more complicated than running the instruments many times. So um, um, that's maybe something that could be a follow up on these on this um, webinar. Uh, a related question. Um, when you make the, the modified surfaces, for example, we are, with spin coating, uh, how do you know that it is firmly attached? I mean, when you put it in the instrument, how do you know that you have that model surface uh, along the study? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that, that's why you really have to measure before and after and also measure for a while to make sure that you have a stable baseline once you have sort of um, spin coated your substrate there. Uh, of course, we can also do some visual inspection because when you spin coat a layer of uh, plastics or, or soil, for instance, you will get this uh, fringe pattern, sort of uh, interference, um, creating different color shifts depending on the thickness of the layers. You, you will actually see that you have a uh, modification of your surface. And if you then add water uh, you, and then dry it again, you can see if you still have the same color afterwards. Mm. Uh, so you get some. Sort of visual inspection will give you some information, but definitely uh, the instrument will also tell you if it's stable or not. Because as soon as you start to add your pure water or, or um, buffer, if you sort of get a drift uh, in your instrument, that will tell you that you're already sort of removing your model layer. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if everybody still uh, who have read uh, written questions are still on, but uh, I got a more of a physics or physical chemistry question rather than maybe surface techniques. Using the ellipsometry uh, and the polarization then of the light, um, is it possible to sort of difference between different liquid crystalline phases on your surface? For example, if you have hexagonal or lamellar phases. That I mean, uh, not now talking about the the mass, but uh, can you get information regarding that from these methods? Uh, no, definitely not from the nulling ellipsometry that we have used in this case. Possibly from spectroscopic ellipsometry, that is a different technique, and that we also have access to. Because then you measure uh, not only with one wavelength, but you can actually use a uh, full spectrum of different wavelengths from UV to IR. And that can give you information of, um, well, adsorption of light, for instance, at different uh, wavelengths, but also sort of um, um, uh, some other more material specific information. But I still think it would be difficult to, to tell different liquid crystalline phases apart. So that would be much better to use uh, um, um, SACS. Mm. But, um, ellipsometry is also a bit sensitive to structured layers, actually. So, I mean, it's sort of it's based mainly on that you have an isotropic layer on your surface. So if you start to have crystal structures, you could get different refractive index and response depending on the orientation of your layer. It might be possible to see those type of things with uh, spectroscopic ellipsometry, but SACS would be much more straightforward. Okay, then I just have one final question for you from the question box, and that's a very open question. Uh, do you have any uh, food applications that you know about for, for these techniques? Oh, good question. Uh, yes, we do. I mean, we have been looking at uh, different dairy products, for instance, and how they interact with the packaging materials. Um, that's one I, I remember from the top of my mind. And do you have anything, Anna, that you remember? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, this, as I think of these techniques, they can also always be thought of as looking at interactions between ingredients, interactions between different um, molecules or ingredients. So uh, you can also think of it as to see if you have abs um, absorption uh, and association 
so in that way, you can look at pure ingredients and see what you have. But I mean, then, then there are probably other techniques that could be more relevant for, for your bulk, a bulk understanding of it. Um, but for, for food or ingredient association with, uh, with packaging, it's a no brainer. Then yes, this is also what I think of. Um, oh. Packaging and also uh, uh, processing equipment. Yes, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there could be other ones out there. Um, so it's a good question and uh, we will uh, look for it because it would be fun and interesting also for us, of course. And with this, I think, I hope that I have either um, posed your questions or that you have gotten some of it responded to by me in the chat. Um, there are also some uh, little more um, in-depth and very specific questions that I hope that perhaps we can take offline. You have to be as contact details here on the on the final slide. So it has been wonderful uh, to to see that there were so many people engaged and um, I thank you to Bias for uh, doing a really good job on something that's quite complicated but it's still at the same time very very appli applicable. So with this, um, if there are no one more writing, oh, now they are writing. Okay, <laughs> okay. But I think that now we have to leave, uh, let the Tobias go. So please take contact with uh, Tobias separately uh, so that we can um, uh, uh, really respond well to, to the, these final questions. Um, so with that, Thank you very, very much for attending this webinar through AOCS. Yeah, thank you.